It's a shame that a word has been so misused that it has produced such conflict, confusion among God's people. Especially those who stand in the pulpit and preach that a person must turn, turn from his sins in order to be saved. Because that is not the gospel, and that is not what is meant. And many of the verses that are found in the Old Testament, I believe, clarify a clear understanding of what it means by repentance. Repentance in the Old Testament. If you'll notice there in your notes I, at the very top, this message is designed to prove that repentance does not mean turn from your sins to be saved from hell or to go to heaven. And I want to show you that turning from your sins in order to be saved is works for salvation. You can't cut it any other way. And works for salvation is not the gospel. And though it is proclaimed worldwide that it is. So I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. You've got your notes, but you just write in your notes about certain things that I will comment on, but I do not want you to follow the notes only. If you use one of the church Bibles in the pew, it will be exactly on the same page that I am on, and I can tell you what page to turn to if that would help you. A little bit. So Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 26. This is on page 230 in the Oskoka Reference Bible. These verses are very important because God laid out to the nation of Israel how he would deal with them. These verses are not verses on how to go to heaven, how to stay out of hell. They're written to a nation on how to receive one of two things, blessings or cursings. So you notice in verse 20, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Verse 27, a blessing, you notice the next word, if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. A blessing if you obey. Very simple. Land it out so that nobody misunderstands. Now, as we go through these verses, understand this. The principles laid down in these verses that we're going to look at can also be applied to you as an individual. You may have trusted Christ as your Savior. That's why you're going to heaven. Not because you stopped something or started something, joined something, given something. Salvation is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But God didn't take you home yet. You're still here. Now we're talking about how you live your life. What is going to determine whether God blesses you or puts a curse upon you? That's not to determine your destination. That's already decided by the decision to trust Christ as your only hope of going to heaven. Now, to the nation of Israel, if they wanted to have national blessings or a national curse, it depends upon whether or not they would do one of these two things. Verse 27, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Look at verse 28. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord. So whether they got a blessing or a curse depended upon whether they would obey or disobey what God says to do. So the Lord explains it and tells us uh, what we need to understand here. You and I need to understand that if you want God to bless your life here, then it could be the results of did you obey what he wanted you to do. And if you don't, then God's going to have to beat the tar out of you, chasing you, maybe take you home before your time. So how you live life is not what determines your destination, which is totally opposite of what everybody thinks. 
We're always under the impression if you're good, you go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. Let me dispel all of that. There is none good. There is none good. No, not one. There's only one that's good, and that's God, and that's Jesus Christ. So nobody has ever lived good enough to go to heaven. <clears throat> but we have all lived bad enough to go to hell. So aren't you glad that God is not going to allow us to all suffer the consequences because he made provision? And those who will accept Christ as Savior can have eternal life and go to heaven. So your destination depends upon you either accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ as your only hope because you can not earn it. Salvation is not a reward that you get because you've been good. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of God's perfection. God is perfect. We are not. We've all come short of God's perfection. Therefore, if anybody goes to heaven, it'll have to be a gift. Because if you can't earn it, it'll have to be free. And that's why the Bible says it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, turn in your Bible to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus in chapter 32. The book of Exodus in chapter 32. Now, Moses and the Lord had, had a, a few words. The Lord's just about ready to take them all out of here. So Moses intervened on Israel's behalf. Because, see, God had miraculously used a, an old man, 80 years old. That's not that old. <laughs> and he took him down into Egypt and says, let my people go and... Lo and behold, after a while, they finally consented, and here they came. Now, Israel had become so bad and did so many wicked things. The Lord had got angry and mad at them. And so God was about ready to just destroy the whole nation. He told Moses, he said, I'll just start all over again and make you the leader, and we'll start all over again. So the Lord, Moses said, no, no, Lord, no, you can't do that. What do you think those people down in Egypt are going to say? So he was concerned about God's testimony. Look at verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath hot against, wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? In other words, you brought them out. You did that. And everybody's heard you did that. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath. Now here's Moses telling God to turn from his fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Moses, a man, telling God that, God, you need to repent. He said, that can't be in the Bible. I just read it. He told God, you need to turn from your fierce anger and repent of this evil. Now, can God turn from sin? Now, this is what makes it interesting. Because I believe that it's used throughout the Old Testament. And it's very interesting. So you've got to try to understand, well, what is he really saying? So he says... Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, thy servant, to whom thou swearest that by thy own self, and saith unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Lord, don't you remember making that vow? Didn't you make that promise? And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Boy, it's about time we got God to straighten up and fly right, ain't it? Now, aren't you glad that God finally turned from his sin so he could go to heaven? 
Do you believe that's what he's talking about? No, 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 no. Remember this. It also makes a statement that God says, and I'll show you this in a little bit. God said, I created evil. So what in the world would that mean? God, I created evil. And down here when he says in verse 14, and the Lord repented of the evil. See, repent is you change your mind, think differently, reconsider. Uh, God had already said this. If ye obey, I'll do this. If you disobey, I will do this. So when Israel disobeys God, God then is free to chasten his people, his nation, because they can't just live as they please and get away with it. I believe there's a principle here. You can't live as you please and get away with it. You just don't know the consequences. He ain't through with you yet. Well, everything's good so far. Yeah, just like that person that jumped off the Empire State Building halfway down. Hey, so far, so good. <laughs> but you know, they got an appointment with the concrete. Now, when he talks about the evil, you see, the evil is the consequences of your sin. You see, God can bring upon anybody the consequences of their sin. God is free to determine what form of punishment he's going to mete out to you. You can choose whatever sin you want to. Thou shalt not kill. You can kill. Thou shalt not lie. You can lie. You can, you see me, I can do all this bad. Of course you can. But there's consequences. And then God is free to do whatever he wants. He can take your life out of here, put you in a wheelchair, put you in a hospital, Take all your money away. God can do all kinds of things. And I'm not saying he will. I'm just saying what he's free to do. And sometimes by the mercy of God, you don't suffer the consequences of your disobedience. Because God may have a higher purpose. And he doesn't always tell us. So God was going to, and he could have been justified because he already told Israel what was going to happen if they did it. But Moses intervened. And so God says <clears throat> he would reconsider by mercy and he gave him another chance. Aren't you glad that God is a God of first chance, second chance, third chance, and fourth chance? How many chances has he given you and he hasn't slapped you down yet? And so you think because nothing has happened, you're free to do more wrong. Read the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and see how you come out. <laughs> And he says, some think that that means that God's not going to do anything because nothing happened. And so if you know the Bible, you know it could happen at any moment. God's chastening hand. Now, I want you to take your Bible and look at the book of Amos in chapter 3. The book of Amos. Now, this is not in your notes, but the book of Amos Chapter 3, and this is on page 936 in your Bible. And notice what he says here in Amos chapter 3 and verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Because generally when the trumpet's blown, it means they're being attacked. He says... Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? No, wait a minute. The Lord hath not done it? Evil? Look at all the evil that's in America right now. Look at all the evil that's been done. And God's taking the credit. Wait a minute. There's consequences to men's sins. God can bring the evil consequences because of the sins of the people. And God can bring it because he says, Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And God will see to it that you can reap what you have sown. Otherwise, there's no one on the throne to see that you suffer the consequences of wrong decisions. There is a God on the throne, and he is a perfect God, a righteous God, and he does nothing wrong. God cannot sin. Totally 
impossible. Now, I want you to look in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah 45. And look there in verse 7. Well, let's just start there in verse 6. He says, this is on page 754. And verse 6 says, That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord. There is none else. There is not another God. There's only one God. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Remember this. God cannot sin. God never sins. God leads no man into sin. God doesn't tempt any man to sin. But he says, I create evil. He creates evil. The results, the consequences of your wrong decisions. In other words, it's like a law that God has set up. There's consequences when you plant the wrong seed. Something's going to grow from that. God causes that. God can allow the devil to come after you with his permission. God can allow lots of things to happen in your life that you will consider to be just consequences. But God can allow those consequences to be good consequences or evil consequences. If you obey or if you do not obey. See, nobody can force you to know Christ. No one can force you to live for the Lord. That is a choice that you are free to make. But understand that just because you choose to do whatever you want to do, there's no consequences to your decisions. It can happen at any time, and you might as well know and understand. Every man shall give account of himself to God. And so I believe that that is a very good verse, but you ought to write down in your notes, if you choose to, uh, the fruit of sin. The evil is the fruit, the result of your rebellion, your disobedience to God. He says, if you do this, obey my word, I'll do this and bless if you do this, I'll do this. So what God does is a reaction to what you do. And there's consequences. There's cause and effect. So understand what God is talking about. Turn in the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers. Old Testament. Numbers in chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23. <clears throat> Number 23 and look in verse 19. Verse 19, God, now there's a problem that had been going on with Balak and Balaam. And um, he was trying to get <clears throat> him to um, put a curse on Israel. He was a prophet of God. So Balaam was, uh, I guess you could say, any for the money. He said, I, I, can't, I can't curse Israel. I can't do it. If he tried, he couldn't do it. So this is what he said, finally. God is not a man. He's already given his word. He done told you, not done told you. God is not a man. That he should lie. That word lie, you ought to just put it in your note. He cannot sin. God cannot sin. He can't lie. God is perfect. God is righteous. He cannot sin. Nor the son of man that he needs to repent. To turn from sin. I don't believe that uh, Christ can sin. Never needed to repent or turn from the sin. Not there. Hath he said him, shall he not do it? In other words, when God gives his word, cannot God do what he says he's going to do? Isn't faith, we say, the uh, believing that what God had promised, he is also able to perform? That's a good definition of the word faith. Believing that what God promised, he, he will do. 
God promised that if I trust him as my Savior, he would give me as a free gift eternal life, and I get to go to heaven on what he did. I don't have to earn it. You mean I don't have to be good to go to heaven? No. I don't have to turn from my sins? No. I don't have to live right? No. See, a preacher that says, no, 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 you really do, no, 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 then they don't get it. They can't believe that God loves you that much that he would give you eternal life as a free gift and you can go to heaven and you don't have to promise to serve him. You don't have to stop being bad and start being good. This is to show how much God loves us, not to show how much we love God. So there's a clear understanding of what God will and will not do. So God never had to turn from a sin. But God did repent over and over and over again. But the reconsideration was because if you do this, I will do this. And if you do this, I will do this. It was the consequences of your choice. You see, you are free to choose. God did not make you or I robots. We have a mind we can decide. We can choose to believe in God or not to believe in God. But there's consequences of your decision. I cannot get a hold of God, bring him down here and say, there he is. No. But the Bible says, there is this light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And this light is the evidence that there is a God. The world itself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And this Word that was God, all things were made by Him, which was Christ. And then in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that is the proof that there is a God. That's the evidence. One evidence? Well, there it is. Did you do it? I didn't do it. You did you do it? You see, God did it, and that's his evidence. And that's all the evidence you need that, no, there is a God. Now, if you will accept truth, truth will lead to truth. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 18. There's several verses here that I want us to look at. Because he's talking a little bit about the potter's house and how that God is able to take a piece of pottery and if it doesn't yield itself, then he's able to break it and remake it into the shape of whatever he wants. God says the potter has power over the clay. He refers to the nation of Israel, you are the clay and I am the potter. And I will apply the word of God and the water of the word. And you are the one that decides to be teachable, you know, pliable in the hands of God. Or you can harden yourself against the will of God. And if you harden yourself against the will of God, then I have the right to break you. And I have the right to remake you. But it's based upon whether or not will you obey or will you not obey. You are a child of God. You've trusted Christ as your Savior. You're now going to heaven when you die. The Lord wants to mold you into the image of Christ. And by your studying of the water of the word and applying it, you become teachable, pliable in God's hands. And God can apply pressure from the world and he can also apply pressure from the inside of you to the person of the Holy Spirit to mold you into the image of Christ. That's why he says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may consider Proof, what is this perfect will of God? Now, you can harden yourself. Every one of you in this room, you can harden yourself to what God wants for your life. You can rebel against Him. Nobody can make you teachable and pliable. You can have a tender spirit or you can have a hard heart. Your choice. 
but there's consequences. And you'll lose out, and you'll never be that vessel that God wanted to use for his power, for his honor, for his glory. And you'll be a dishonorable vessel, one that God has to set aside and not use. One of the greatest joys in the world is knowing that you are a vessel fit for the master's use, that God can use you for his honor and for his glory. Now, notice what he says. Look very quickly down here in uh, verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemeth good to the potter to make it. Then the Lord said, I've got a word for you. This is what I want you to know. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning the kingdom to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy. God said, I'm still on the throne and I'm still the potter and I'm still in charge. And you can rebel all you want. Go your own way. Do your own thing. But that doesn't limit what God can do to you. I mean, where can you run that you may hide from the power of God? Look in verse 8. See that small word? If, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. See, and you'll notice it in the New Testament also. Generally, when you see the word repent, there's a word thought, think, suppose, somewhere close by. You thought this, and you had to change your mind. Think differently. Reconsider. God says you did this, and I'm not going to do this. But if you correct the problem, I can change my mind about doing this because you changed your mind about what you were going to do. And so if you change your mind, God says, I changed my mind. I was fixing to whoop you, but you got it right, and I didn't do it. See, God's not a sinner. Turning from this evil results of consequences of your disobedience. But there's some people who don't get this and they twist these scriptures and make them say things that they, they don't say. Now get this. This will knock your socks off if you have socks on. Look what he says there in verse 9. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning the kingdom to build and to plant it. Look in verse 10. You ought to circle that first word there. If. You do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice. Then I will repent of the what? See, you can repent of evil and you can repent of good. You see, everybody can change their mind about anything. I'm going to marry this girl. I changed my mind. What did you mean? You didn't marry her. I'm going to go to church today. But you didn't come. You repented. You changed your mind. I'm going to go to the bar today and get drunk. And you repented. You changed your mind. You didn't. You came to church today. Glad to have you. <laughs> so you can change your mind about a lot of different things. It all depends on what's the context. What does God want you to change your mind about? And so when the people of Israel would rebel, God would chasten them. You read the book of Judges over and over again. And they did that which was right in their own eyes. And God would have to chasten them. They cried out to the Lord and God would deliver them and give them another chance. <clears throat> A lot of things you can learn from this. But notice what he says here in verse 10. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice. You notice he obeying the voice or not obeying. That's your choice. Then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit. In other words, what happened to you in life sometimes? It's not the way it could have been or should have been. You could have changed it. You ever hear that song? Whatever will be, will be. No, it's not. I don't believe in Calvinism and fatal predestination. I believe you make a decision. And God can either bless or chase you. I don't believe that God's already planned out every little thing that's going on. I believe I'm making decisions today that can affect down the road. And there's a God in heaven that can work and bless my life. I believe the perfect will for God for my life is the very next decision I make. 
You see, if you're not doing right and you decide to correct it, that's as close as the next decision you make to getting back into the will of God. He said, I, I would have benefited you. I, I wanted to do good, but you wouldn't let me because God is a perfect God. And see, rebellion has to be taken and dealt with. Now, nobody can make you obey the Lord, but you can rebel against the Lord. And if you rebel against the Lord, I want you to learn the principle. God laid it down in the Old Testament. He says, search these scriptures. He says that you can be wise concerning the things that God has taught us, that we can learn from these things. Take your Bible also and turn to Jeremiah 26. Jeremiah 26. And see the importance of every word in the scriptures. <clears throat> Now, Josiah was a king, pretty good fellow. But notice what he said in verse 2. This is Jeremiah chapter 26. This is on page 799. And in verse 2 he says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. Every word important. <clears throat> then he says in verse 3, If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them. Now look at the last part of it. Because of the evil of their doing. You see, what God was going to do was a result of what they were doing. Now, do I want God to bless me? Yes, I do then I need to do what will bring it. And if I decide to go my own way, will God let me go my own way? Will God let me be disobedient? Yes. But do I, should I expect God to do something about it? Once you understand this, you'd be surprised it's the good key to restrain yourself, to discipline yourself, to get as close to the Lord as you possibly can. Now, you can do whatever you want to do. Go your own way. Do your own thing. My life. Yeah, it's your life. You brought yourself into this world. You created that body you have. You did it. You're a self-made man. I can see that. But like Verbal said the other night, he's talking to a guy that was an atheist. He says, God has your name right here in the Bible. Your, your name is right here in the Bible. He says it is not. He says it is too. And so he showed him. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There you are. There you are right there. The last part, which I purpose to do. In other words, the purpose of God was to bless you. The purpose of God is he wants good things for you. But he will not bless disobedience. He will not bless rebellion. He won't do it for an individual, and he doesn't do it for a nation. This turning from their sin and so forth is not so they can go to heaven. It's not a heaven and hell issue. It's to block the blessings in this life upon this earth while you live. Salvation is the gift of God. It's not of works. Turn your page over if you haven't done so yet. Hey, you have to tell somebody to page two. Now look in the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Everybody knows about Jonah. God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. He thought, there's mine. I will not. And so he ran from the presence of the Lord. Now tell me how you can run from the presence of the Lord. Where is God? He's everywhere. And you're going to run where? From the presence of the Lord. Don't that sound a little stupid? Where can you run that God isn't? If he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, right? <coughs> but anyway, he, he ran from the Lord. And God <laughs> brought a storm. See, the storm could have taken his life. Even the guys that was on the boat were concerned. They said, well, why is he, God doing all of this? And lo and behold, Jonah told him, he says, because of me. 
You mean a God in heaven is that concerned about this one man? That he'd bring a whole storm? Well, he did. Did you know that God's concerned about you? You'd be surprised all the things that God will do just to get your attention. You know, sometimes you have to use a two before to get some people to listen. Now, I don't know what God will have to do to you. Have you ever noticed you can have some children and you can just look at them and they'll straighten up? And other ones, you've got to try everything in the boat and then you'll go get the two before. And then sometimes that don't even work. You have to kill them. But some people are just hard-hearted. It doesn't matter. And sometimes somebody can be broken-hearted. They just read a verse and, whoo, here's a bit they want to get back to the Lord. And the other people are so defiant, like Gilligan. One time I turned it on, and I never watched the full thing of it. But I turned it on and says, you can't make me. You can't make me. You can't make me. And then he was doing it. So here in the book of Jonah, in chapter 3, on page 944, God had told him, go to the city. He went to the city. Tell the people, 40 days, they're going to be overthrown, which probably meant you're going to be overtaken. Some enemy's going to come, do you in. hundred years later, it happened. But anyway, right now, in verse 4, and Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey, and he cried, and 40 days, the city's going to be overthrown. And verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed him. They believe that this is going to take place. And you go down through here, and even the king says, look, if that's going to happen, let's get right. Now, I believe that Jonah might have been a preacher of righteousness. He might have explained to them about where you're going to go when you die. But see, where they're going when they die is one issue. And the consequences of their evil doings is uh, another story. Because God could just kill them all. Now, get what he says. He arose. He went. So when the king heard it, he said, we're having a fast. Verse 7, and he caused it to be published or proclaimed throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, cry mightily unto God, and yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. In other words, not, that we're not talking about heaven and hell. We're not talking about how to go to heaven. This is because God was going to overthrow the city. This is about them getting things right. You see, God even asks people that are lost certain things that they ought to do. And it's just like in America. Even though there's a lot of people that didn't know the Lord, some of those lost people had higher standards than Christians do today. Put us to a shame. But now it's uh, like we've kind of lost our, you know, the salt's lost its flavor. So most Christians are good for nothing. Now get what he says. And look what he says in verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Now, individually, you can trust the Lord, have eternal life, and go to heaven when you die. But this is more than meets the eye. This is talking about a judgment upon this city. And so he says here in verse 10, And God saw their, you ought to underline this word, circle this word. It's a very important word. He saw their works. What was their works? That they turn from their evil way. Now, if turning from your sin is a work, then do we tell lost people to turn from their sin in order to be saved if salvation is by grace? See, salvation is the gift of God. Turning from your sins is the work of man. And if a man has to do these works and turn in from their sin, then salvation can't be free. It would be based upon man's works. So telling a lost man he has to turn from his sins in order to be saved is works for salvation. And they were straightening up and trying to fly right and doing right as a nation so that God wouldn't destroy them as a nation. And also this verse is showing you that 
when you turn from sins or an evil way, the way that you're living, don't you see <clears throat> that's works? And as God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he didn't do it. He was going to judge them, but look what they did and because of that, God did not destroy them as a city. This is what made Jonah so mad because he wanted God to get them. Jonah was a man without compassion. He wanted to run. He didn't want these Gentiles. But God spared them. But you see, you can't take verses and say, well, repent means to turn from your sin. Okay, how many times have we read so far that God repented? Did God turn from sin? Then it can't mean that. See, God says, if you do this, I will do this. Well, if you change it and you correct the problem and God gives you a little mercy so you'll correct the problem, a little time, think through, think differently, reconsider, then God can do the same thing. But what he was going to do didn't mean it was wrong. Changing his mind wasn't wrong. God never turns from sin, but he can re turn from the evil that he was going to bring upon them. And that's why this is so important. Turn in your Bible to the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 8. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 8. And you'll notice that once again, referring back to the times of when they were told about the results of their decisions that they would make. And then God says, that he had to take them out of the land. They went into captivity for 70 years. They'd come back from the land. And God says, I want to bless you. I want to bless you. He wanted that nation to be, you know, a lighthouse to the world. God anticipated that this is this nation of Israel. But he gave them a choice. He's given you and I a choice. And you'd be surprised probably how many of you in this room that know Christ is your Savior, you are not going to serve the Lord with all your heart. You won't do it. You'll know you should, but you still won't do it. You will not dedicate yourself to Him. You probably, some of you will never win a soul to Christ, though you know that's what God wants you to do. Some of you probably could go to Bible college, become a missionary, an evangelist, or a preacher, and give your life to that. And you have that desire, but you'll quench it, and you'll never do it. You could have, but you didn't. Do you think there's consequences to people's rebellion to the will of God? I'm not God. I won't do anything to you. Aren't you glad of that? I'm glad of that. I don't want to play God in people's lives. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I, all I'm doing is trying to tell you, this is the book. Judge for yourself. Make whatever decision you want to make. I can't make anybody know God, love God, serve God. Impossible. But here in the book of Zechariah, Chapter 8, look down in verse 13. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, as you were a what? A curse. Why were they a curse? Because of their rebellion, right? The promise from the book of Deuteronomy. Remember? Then he says, So will I save you, and ye shall be a what? Blessing. Blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought, see that word thought? You ought to underline the word thought because that's mean how a person thinks or how God thinks. As I thought to do what? To punish you. When your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not, I did it. I did punish you. So again, have I thought, see the word thought, in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah? Fear ye not. These are the things that ye shall do. Speak every man. Now, get what he's doing now. See, none of these things that he's going to list are ways to go to heaven. This is because God said, I want to bless you. And I'm not going to change my mind. See, there's a time coming when God's going to fulfill 
His promise that he made. And Israel is going to be saved as in a day. And God's going to set up the kingdom upon this earth. And God will fulfill that blessing that he promised to Abraham. The blessing of Abraham. Now get this. He says here in verse 15. So again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear ye not. These are the things that ye shall do. Get this. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. Now, is this what we have to do to go to heaven? No, that has nothing to do with going to heaven. And he says, and peace in your gate. And then he said in verse 7, and let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor and love no false oath. For all these things I hate. God said, this is, I hate this because these are, these are sins. This is going to happen in a day in the book of Jeremiah where God said, I will put a new spirit within you. You will be my child. I'm going to take away that old sinful heart out. And you're going to have a, a new heart. But that doesn't happen now. This is what God is promising is going to happen. I will. I will bless you. Because God given his word. He said, and I will not repent. I will not change my mind about that. That day is coming. Because Israel will be saved as in a day. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation. See, there's things that God will change his mind about. There's things that God will not change his mind about. And when it comes to where you are going to spend eternity, there's some things that um, God will not change his mind about. And you need to know what it is. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 20, there is a day of no repentance. A day of no repentance. See, right now, God says, command every man everywhere to repent. It means you can. You can change your mind. So you might have lived most of your life and you have not trusted Christ as your Savior. You can still change your mind. Recompense. You can repent. Change your mind. Think differently. Reconsider this. Think it through. <clears throat> you can't save yourself. You can't earn your way to heaven. You'll never be good enough. And you, lo and behold, you really believe Christ died on the cross, paid for my sins, and I'm going to trust him as my Savior. And if you'll trust Christ as your Savior, he said he would save you. All you've got to do is repent. Change your mind. Believe. You see, in the Gospel of John, you don't find the word repent mentioned. But you do find the word believe, 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 believe all over the place. See, if you are an unbeliever and you believe, you must have changed your mind. How can you believe if you were not a believer, unbeliever, and, and, and then you, now you believe? So you had to change your mind. Can you understand that? Can you follow me so far? I know I'm hard and difficult to understand. Now, I could repeat my whole sermon all over again. You're an unbeliever and you change your mind. And believe. You repent it. See how simple that is? If you're trusting in your works, your works can't save you. So you trust Christ as your Savior. He gives you eternal life. And he says, he that believeth in me hath eternal life. And he says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, everybody, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, God gave his only begotten Son so that if you'll believe it, you will not go to hell. You'll have everlasting life. You go to heaven on what Christ did for you. You can believe that. And here he makes a statement that God is going to do some judging. Look there in verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell gave up the dead which were in them. It means people that have already died and never trusted the Lord. They're going to stand before God. Every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Look what he says. He says, and they were judged, every man according to what? <coughs> to his work. You see, now you can change your mind and realize I can't save myself by my works and trust Christ. And be saved by grace. It's free. You have eternal life. Free. But if you don't, that means you're trying to earn your way to heaven by how good you are. So if you want to prove that you're good enough to go 
by your works, then lo and behold, why wouldn't God judge you for your works? To see whether or not, did you qualify? Would you really want to stand before God and try to prove to God you never did anything wrong? And all he has to do is ask your wife or ask your kids or your mother or your father. Would you want your destiny to depend upon him giving a good report? He never did anything wrong. Not one time in his whole life. I think you will be in trouble. So he's going to judge every man according to his work. Why? Because you didn't want to get saved by grace. You thought you could get saved by your works. Okay, let's take a look. And God's going to show and prove to every man that he is without excuse. That he came up short. So you'd have to live a perfect life from the day you're born to the time you die. How you doing? So then he says this. In verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In verse 15, and whosoever, anybody, doesn't matter who it is, was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. There is no repentance here. You can't change your mind. It's too late. If your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, when you leave this world, you do not get into heaven. See, you were born into this world, your name is in the book of the living, and you're going to die. But when you trust Christ as your Savior, you're in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. This book, there is no death recorded. This book, according to the book of Genesis in chapter 5, this is the book of the generation of Adam, and they all die. In the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 1, there is no death recorded. See, once you trust Christ as Savior, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, I was written into the Book of the Living when I was born into this world, and that was 1942. You didn't know I was so old, did you? You thought I was only 50. Well, I, I didn't want to deceive you. I'm 60. But I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I was born into God's family. In 1960, I was 18 years old. So you see, I got my name written in both books, but this old flesh, it's dead. I'm not worried about it. And God will never cast your name out of the book of life. When Moses prayed, he said, brought my name out of the book of the living. Different book. This is why this is no repentance. So if you're going to change your mind and trust Christ as your Savior, when should you do it? Now or wait till then? I didn't hear you. Now. now. So if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you're not going to heaven. But you can. But you'll have to reconsider. You're going to have to think it through and put your faith in what Christ did on the cross for you. And now is a perfectly good time to do it. Now let me show you how you do that. Look up there. This hand represents you and me, and the wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. God loves us. Now, he hates our sin, but he loves us. He loves you. So the Bible says for us to go to heaven, we have to be perfect, but nobody's perfect. Because the wages of sin is death, and we're all condemned. So if you want to go to heaven, you have to be perfect, and you can't have no sin in heaven. Because if we could sin in heaven then heaven won't be heaven anymore. It'll be just like we did down here. How, how, how have we done down here? It's not good. And God says, uh-uh, no, you ain't coming up here. So God says, you have to be perfect when nobody's perfect. God says, you cannot save yourself. So going to church, that's a nice thing to do, but it's not going to wash your sins away. You can do all the things you want to do. You can try to quit all. You can't take away your sin. The wages of sin is death. You've got to die. This hand represents Jesus Christ. God in the flesh. He had no sinful nature, didn't have to die. So he took all of our sins, paid for them on the cross, and came back from the dead. And he says the only thing that we have to do is believe he did it for us. And when you believe it, he gives you eternal life, and you get to go to heaven on what Christ did for you. That's the gift of God. That's free. Now, right now, see, if you have not done this, you can still change your mind. You can still believe it. But once you die, there is no more chance. There is no more day of repentance. You can't reconsider. 
It's over. Opportunity is all gone. It's appointed unto every man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Is it critical? Is it important? I think so. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed, and no one looking around. If you're here this morning and you never trusted Christ as your Savior, if I had the power to save everybody, I would do it, but I'd have none. I can only tell you about somebody who can. God loves you, paid for your sins, came back from the dead. All he wanted you to do is believe he did it for you, and you can handle that because it's not by your works. You can't earn it. It's a gift, totally free. I'm going to ask you in just a moment for you to raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you. I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I would like to know, and I'd like to have prayer for you. Would you let me do that for you? This morning, will you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your only hope of going to heaven? Do it now. I pray that you would. It's a sign of good judgment. And if you will trust Christ as your Savior right now, would you just slip your hand up very quickly, put it right back down, just real quick, put it up, put it right back down. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. You don't want it all. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you know someone who hasn't. Talk to them. Help them to understand the importance of it. Father, we ask your blessings upon each person here and those that are watching by the Internet. That if they will trust you as Savior, that, Lord, they, they just let us know by just simply clicking on the computer and saying, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior. We thank you for each person here and all that you've done for us, for the clarity you've given us in your word, that we don't have to be afraid of repent and repentance and all that, because you've explained it to us very well. Thank you for this time together. Give us a good service tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.